Hey everyone, my name's Matthew Wynn. Um, I'll be the one of the PsyD students that is currently uh, in a program at Divine Mercy. I'm so glad that everyone was able to make it to the webinar today. As we were still waiting for people to come in, I just wanted to introduce myself and um, where I'm at right now and kind of what um, I'll be kind of here for today. Uh, so I'm a second year student in the PsyD program, uh, and which means that along with classes right now, I'm also um, part of the externship program that we have here at Divine Mercy called the IPS Center, which is where, which is a clinic that we have where I'm actually seeing clients um, over telehealth and in person. Um, and practicing the skills that I've learned the first year, and also the skills that I've been learning um, throughout this year as well. So I'll be here to answer any questions you might have. So if you want, uh, you can put your questions down in the Q&A box, um, and I can answer them if I know the answer to them um, to the best of my ability. Um, anything about my experience here so far or how it's been in the program or any questions that you might have that um, you think that a second year in the PsyD program might be able to answer. So again, thanks for your patience um, as we wait for people to come in and everyone to log on. Um, and if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. So it looks like we just got a question from Elizabeth. Thank you for your question. She's asking, how many days a week are internships and classes? That's a very good question, especially as I'm trying to divvy up time. So the first every every year of the program is going to be different depending on what year you're at. There's going to be a different um, kind of balance between classes and seeing clients. The first year is all classes. So my first year, I had about five or six classes per semester, and each class was about three to four, uh, three to four hours long. Um, now, don't let that scare you because we're only having uh, every day. There was only about one or two classes per day. So that's about anywhere from four to six hours per day. Um, that's just straight classes. Um, and then we always have like one day out of the week where we don't have any classes. So about four days out of, the, uh, out of all the weekdays, you'll have classes for about four to six hours. Um, and that's the first year. Now, I'm in my second year and I'm taking about four to five classes. So as um, uh, as client work increases, um, like school work kind of balances out and decreases a little bit. Um, and so currently in, in my externship right now, the IPS Center is actually attached to Divine Mercy University. And I'm seeing my client for uh, an hour every week. And some of us have two clients that we see uh, that they see um, so, so for a total of two face-to-face uh, -face hours. Um, and then we have like note work um, and then documentation and whatnot. Then we have supervision for an hour as well um, in which uh, a licensed clinical psychologist and one of our uh, like mentors and educators would sit down with us and we would talk about our client for about our clients for about an hour as well. As the years go, on like third and fourth year, um, the expectation to be in classes uh, will kind of decrease even more to two days a week as you're working at your externship or your internship. Um, and then by the fifth year, um, you'll have virtually no classes um, and you'll be like working on your dissertation if you still have to finish that up. And then it, it's almost like a full-time job once you reach your fifth year. Um, if that answers your question, there you go. Um, if you are searching for any more clarifying questions, let me know. All right, we have another question from Dayspring. And her question is, are you on campus? And what has your experience been with that? I am on campus. The SciD program is um, an entirely in-person program, which means that all of our classes are in person. And I would have to co commute to classes every um, every day, or as many times as I have classes throughout the day, throughout the week. Um, and my experience has been great. It's being in person is, um, I think, necessary for this program, especially as we're practicing 
our clinical skills and role playing um, within our labs, especially. Um, I, I'm also taking a, a, an assessment class right now. Well, actually, I've been taking assessment classes for almost three semesters now, um, in which we are learning like cognitive assessments and personality assessments, um, like the Rorschach and the IQ test and whatnot. And so those are very necessary to be in person in order for us to practice administering those assessments as well. Um, our, all of our professors are fantastic. Um, and all of our faculty members are um, very, very prestigious within their own fields and uh, their, each of their topics that they're, they specialize in. And so it's been great to interact with them as well. Um, for, for most of the week, a lot of the society students are able to interact with each other as well. There's daily mass, uh, there's confession on Tuesdays, and there's plenty of opportunities on campus um, to mingle with everybody and to chat and to also like consult about clients sometimes and talk about our experience um, with clients. Uh, we have Joan, uh, if, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, we have Joan asking how much of the PhD uh, program can be done online. So like I mentioned before, um, the PhD, uh, the, we have a side, uh, the doctor program that we have is a side program. It's entirely in person. Last year, because of COVID, we had um, the uh, hybrid option where you could come in or be online. But this year, um, especially with APA kind of regulations and accreditation, um, we've we've moved to back to in person. Um, as of right now, with all the COVID regulations that are coming out, we're all wearing masks uh, at the moment. Um, but hopefully. Uh, the entire pandemic will kind of calm down a little bit. I see Thomas joined. Thanks, Matt. Sure. Okay. What well, what we'll do is um, if it's all right with everybody, I'm sure Matt was uh, very informative. So I appreciate that, Matt. So what we'll do is just go ahead and run through the overview, and then we'll go back to the Q and A if that's okay. Sounds good. All right. Again, thank you, Matt, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Tom Brooks, and I'm the vice president of enrollment marketing here at DMU. I'll be your host this evening along with Matt and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get started here. And like I said, afterwards, we'll go into a Q&A session. Our hope is that you'll get a lot of, you know, program information and then Matt can tell you about personal experiences from his side of the world and, and, and uh, what he does outside of DMU. So um, let me move this real quick. All right. First of all, welcome to Divine Mercy University. Um, DMU is a Catholic institution comprised of two schools. It is dedicated to the scientific study of psychology with a Catholic Christian understanding of the person, marriage, and family. Uh, DMU was founded in 1999 as the Institute for the Psychological Sciences. In 2014, the Institute launched its MS in Psychology program online with its focus educating working professionals. We call it a helping degree. The MS in psychology online does not lead to licensure. Um, in 2015, we changed the name from the IPS to um, Divine Mercy University when we added the School of Counseling, which is our second school. And as I mentioned earlier, the two schools School of Counseling currently houses um, the MS in Counseling, which is online, but they have a residency component, so we say hybrid as well, meaning that they come in once a year for about five days to go through um, everything from interviewing techniques to um, just a ton of different things, but they get to do it with their cohort, which they've been working with, you know, uh, over that time, and, you know, they get to know each other. This affords them a chance to really get to, to know each other and see each other face to face, as well as their instructors. The other school is IPS, of course, which offers a PsyD in clinical psychology, and that's a campus-based program, and the MS in psychology as well. In addition to earning your PsyD, it's a, and we'll get to that in a minute, but I do want to let folks know they do earn their master's in clinical psychology as well during that five-year program uh, in PsyD. 
DMU mission provides students with an effective academic and educational environment that supports the integration of the psychological sciences and a Catholic Christian understanding of the person. We prepare students to respond to their vocation as mental health professionals. Where are we located? I'm not sure if Matt shared some of that with you or not, but um, we are in Sterling, Virginia, right near Dulles Airport. And it is uh, about 35 miles, I believe, or 40 miles to downtown DC. And then to the north and uh, west, you have um, Northern Virginia and West Virginia. And um, as you can see from some of the pictures down there, that affords our students and faculty and everybody else that lives local the opportunity to kind of do whatever they really want to do. Um, to the west, you have everything from hiking, uh, whitewater rafting, zip lining. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Camping, you know, all the outdoor adventures you can imagine. Um, you also have a ton of history in, in the area from the Civil War, the, you know, um, you know, War of Independence. I mean, it goes on and on again. Um, and then, of course, you have downtown D.C. And then not out far from us, you, you know, you have the Atlantic Ocean. So you can be to the ocean in a couple hours as well. So don't, no matter what you like doing in your off time, there's plenty to do in the in the area. And, you know, um, it's kind of nice, our location, because you can get anywhere in about an hour and have quite a bit of fun based on what you're, you know, hobbies are and what you want to do. Um, depending on what schools you're looking at, you know, uh, most schools should have accreditation, if not all. Um, it's no different for us. There's a couple different levels of accreditation. And the first one is uh, institutionally accredited by the SACS-COC, which is Southern Association of Colleges and Schools and a Commission on Colleges. SACS is recognized as an accrediting agency of colleges and schools by the Department of Education. DMU voluntary, voluntarily participated in the accrediting process, and we are met or exceeded all standards in thorough evaluations. And what that does is it, it SACS um, allows your school to operate as a school, if you will. Um, and we are no different than, say, University of Virginia. Florida State, um, Wake Forest, any of these other schools, they're all also SAC schools. Um, we also are, are approved by the state of Virginia through the State Council of Higher Education. Um, that allows us to operate as a business, if you will, within the state of Virginia. The PsyD program in particular has been recognized since 2006 as a national register designation program by the Association of State and Provincial Provisional Psychology Boards, um, and that's ASPPB. Um, and then we also are accredited by APA, the American Psychological Association, since 2016. And then for our online programs, we are um, approved to participate in a National Council for State Authorization and Reciprocity Agreements, or what's known as NCSARA. Um, that may, may not mean a whole lot to you guys right now, um, but what it, it means to our students and our graduates are that um, one, you know, we're approved to provide Title IV funding, loans, things like that. And then when it comes to placement into your internships, um, you really wanna be in an APA internship site if you can be. And um, by being APA approved, of course, that allows us to uh, have our students participate in uh, competing for those APA um, clinical sites. Clinical psychology is a psychological specialty that provides continuing and comprehensive mental and behavioral health care for individuals and families. Consultation to agencies and communities, training, education and supervision, and research-based practice. The um, program structure and clinical experience. The program, the PsyD program, let's make sure we're, we're, we're keeping everybody on track here, consists of 122 credit hours, inclusive of both the MSci and PsyD degrees, and I mentioned that earlier. It's a five-year on-site program in Sterling, Virginia, and it prepares for licensure as a clinical psychologist. 
your first year, you, you um, start your coursework, of course, and then you start your dissertation research. So right from the beginning, you're already trying to figure out what your dissertation is going to be. And then, you know, you start doing the research and preparation for that. Year two is coursework and externship. Year three, same thing, coursework and externship. And again, year four, coursework and externship. Sorry. And then year five is your pre-doctoral in internship. I'm sorry. And you defend your dissertation. And there's no classes. Some of the sites that you'll be uh, looking at for your internship, and there's actually many, many sites, but some of the local ones are St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C., the Psychiatric Hospital in Washington, D.C., the VA Medical Center in Martinsburg. It's actually West Virginia. Um, and the bottom number you're looking at says 85% of students are matched with an APA accredited or APIC member internship site. And that was during 2017 and 18. And the last couple of years, we've actually been closer to 100%. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a, a very strong program, course content-wise. And we've built a very strong reputation through the graduates that have gone into their internships. We get quite a bit of, of um, feedback from our sites, of course. And much of that feedback is that our students are, are either well-prepared or better prepared than most of the folks they are competing against for those uh, internships and that um, they're better equipped to go out there and, and start practicing, you know, more advanced um, things. And then also they learn a little bit quicker. So we know what we're doing is, is, is good because the internships are telling us how well prepared our students are. And our students tell us, you know, our graduates tell us that you know, they feel more prepared and they're, they're ready to take on more as they go through their internships. Is a PsyD program right for you? All right, do you want to help people flourish? Are you interested in the science behind human behavior? Do you want to become an instrument of healing through the psychological sciences? Are you interested in performing psychological tests and assessments to diagnose your clients and create treatment plans? And are you looking to start a career as a licensed mental health professional? specifically as a clinical psychologist. So many of you are sitting there going, well, you know, I'm not quite sure yet, maybe. Some of you are sitting there going, I got this. I know this is exactly what I want to do. These questions are really good questions, but, you know, through your own personal experiences, do you find that your friends tend to gravitate to you for information? Do you find that you tend to reach out and help people quicker than others? Do you see that you almost hurt for others when they're hurting and you wish you could help them, you know, stop the hurting and start healing. If these are things you've experienced and, and you feel, you probably stand a good chance of being a good, a good therapist or at least uh, you know, keep moving forward and, and learning more to figure out if this is actually something you want to do. The key areas of competency achieved through the PsyD program, foundations in psychological sciences and research, integrity and practice, assessment and diagnosis, therapeutic intervention, professional roles, and clinical practice from a Catholic integrated perspective. First one is foundations in psychological and sciences and research. Graduates will attain foundational psychological sciences knowledge of biological, cognitive, affective, social, and developmental aspects of the human person, as well as history and systems of psychology, psychological measure measurement, research design, and statistical methods. Graduates will have the skills necessary to conduct their own psychological research. Second one, integrity and practice. Graduates will be knowledgeable in the areas of diversity and ethics and display critical thinking, self-aware and a reflective practice, and self-care. Graduates will demonstrate responsiveness to supervision and collegiality and professional comportment and professional practice. Number three, assessment and diagnosis. Graduates will be able to conduct clinical interviewing, perform intake evaluation, demonstrate knowledge in the administration, scoring and interpretation of psychological assessment, integrate multiple sources, sources of test data and clinical interview information into a written report, diagnose and develop a treatment plan. Number four, therapeutic intervention. 
Graduates will be able to demonstrate case conceptualization, treatment planning, building and maintaining the therapeutic relationship, psychotherapy skills, crisis management of urgent and special circumstances, and discharge planning. Number five, professional roles. Graduates will be able to function in a variety of required roles of professional psychologists to include consultant, educator, supervisor, practice manager and program evaluator. They will be able to work collaboratively within interdisciplinary teams and with clients. Clinical number six, clinical practice from a Catholic integrated perspective. Graduates will have developed a Catholic understanding of the human flourishing in an individual person in marriage and family life, and be able to integrate this with the psychological sciences and clinical practice. All right, some sample employment tracks. These are just a few areas that some of our graduates have gone on and uh, to, to work in, in the field. Um, again, there's a ton more, but we could be here most of the night if we listed them all. One of the areas is a licensed clinical psychologist. Obviously you can hang your own shingle and start practicing. Clinic director, psychiatric technician, psychiatric crisis unit interviewer, community mental health social worker, drug abuse social worker, drug and alcohol specialist, certified alcohol or drug counselors, therapists, and they're labeled as CACs or CADCs, professional psychological resource advisor, psychological behavioral therapist, home project director, group home director. Um, some of these do require additional education or certification or licensure. And um, most of that's relevant to whatever state you're gonna be practicing. Once you graduate, whatever state you go back to, there may be other requirements you need to pay attention to as you go to work in that state. So go through a couple of quick student testimonials and then one video. Um, um, in the first, video, in the first um, shot, you, um, James says, in our clinical psychology program, the training is focused on healing the whole person. Kristen says, I was drawn to the PsyD program out of a desire to serve others in a more profound way than my previous positions offered. Timothy said, this school is not afraid to teach you what it means to be human at every level, psychologically, philosophically, and theologically. That's why he likes it. And then Kirsten said, I am so thankful for DMU. The faculty members are very supportive and I receive a lot of hands-on clinical experience. All right, for the, we're gonna do a quick video, about a minute and a half, and then we'll move on to the rest of the presentation. Um, this is William Johnston, and um, uh, I'll let him tell you in his own words. Hi, my name is William Johnston, and I'm a PsyD student at Divine Mercy University, currently approaching the end of my third year in the program. Military service runs in my family, and, um, and so both my grandparents served, my parents both served. This door, the PsyD program at Divine Mercy University opened that opportunity for me to continue to get back, to conduct research and hopefully implement a more robust program to treat PTSD as it relates to combat veterans. DMU has certainly provided the integration that I've sought in terms of my formation, both the philosophy and theology core in addition to the psychology curriculum, uh, has provided me growth in terms of my faith um, and my role as a husband and father, and of course, a psychological clinician. Um, so in essence, uh, the Catholic Christian meta model of the human person is, is why I'm here, both for my own sake, as well as the sake of my future clients. All right, so um, some of our um, faculty members are highlighted here. Uh, Dr. Lisa Klawicki is a program director and she specializes in adolescent, adult, and couples therapy. Diane Graves, Dr. Graves is an assistant program director, professor 
specialized in child therapy and developmental psychology. Dr. Anna Pecoraro is an associate professor, clinical supervisor, specialized in addictions and trauma treatment. Dr. Philip Scrivani is a professor with us. He is, um, he, uh, his areas of, of specialty is clinical psychology, uh, clinical supervisor, and specialized in cognitive behavioral therapy and group therapy. Dr. William Nordling uh, is a clinical supervisor and he specializes uh, credentials in child, marriage, and family therapy. He's actually one of our, our professors that's nationally ranked um, in, in um, child psychology. And then Dr. Paul Vitz is our senior scholar and professor, and he specializes in integration of Christian theology with psychology. We um, move on to areas like licensing. Is licensing required? You really can't be a licensed psychologist in any state, I believe, at this point, unless you have um, your PsyD. And um, in order to practice, you do, you do need a, a license pretty much in every state. Um, when do you need it? License, licensing process begins after the student completes the practicum and internship and officially graduates from DMU. States can and often do have additional differing requirements and uh, students are responsible for checking state requirements where they plan to work and adhere to them. These typically include national and state exams and DMU will provide general information related to licensure during the student experience. Um, Matt can correct me where I'm wrong, but um, in the in the PsyD program, um, you know, it is expected that our students do the research on whatever state they're going to go back to to understand the licensing requirements, and then um, you know they bring that to uh, the program director and or their advisor um, to also talk through. Uh, what will be necessary to make sure that they transition from DMU to wherever they're going to go in the United States or around the world. And, you know, they get licensed as, as they move forward. Um, you do have a, a, a faculty advisor that works with you and they, they definitely will spend time to make sure you understand the process and how to research it. And then, you know, help you with decisions on what you need to do as you, you get through that research. Who initiates the licensing? Licensing is a student-driven process. It is important for the student to begin research of licensing requirements in the state he or she intends to work in as early in the program as possible. And will students be fully licensed after graduation? No. Graduates must work approximately one year in a supervised clinical environment in addition to the other state requirements to be licensed. The graduate may be required to obtain a provisional license for this year period and you can check your state requirements. And again, your advisor will be able to help you walk through that. So let's talk a little bit about investing in your education and what that really means. Um, all of you, um, well, let me rephrase that. Everybody that's on here should have their undergraduate degree or on their way to getting it, um, meaning they're a senior this year. So you already understand the concept of, of investing in your education at an undergraduate level. And, you know, kudos to you for making that investment. Some of you are fortunate. Maybe you had, you know, money put aside and was able to, to um, pay for your education out of pocket. Many probably had to take out loans, get scholarships, grants, those kind of things. Um, but you, you understood the value of the education that you're, you're getting. We use a little analogy here where, you know, something such as a car or even a house for that matter, um, you can put a lot of money into a car and all a car does is depreciate year after year. It just goes down. And then depending how poorly you drive it or how well you drive it, you're either going to keep it, you know, nice or maybe not so much. And, um, but either way, most times your value is going down in education. It's a, it's a pretty simple thing. The more you invest in yourself in terms of, of, of time, knowledge, research, work, and then obviously money the more you're going to be able to take out into the world and, and apply both in your work setting. And, you know, as the video, the gentleman in the video said earlier, um, you know, it's relevant to your personal life. It's relevant to your professional life and, and to you personally. Um, 
So, you know, you're not investing just in an education, you know, to learn, you know, simple things. You're investing in an education that you learn um, qualities, you gain experience and you do, um, you know, research in order to be able to, to work in all kinds of different settings from a mental health perspective. And a lot of times that starts with yourself. You start to learn to ask yourself questions about what you're doing, why you're motivated to do those things and, you know, how to either enhance or change behaviors. So your education is, is you know, obviously you're going to earn money and those kind of things as you go out into the world and work. But, you know, the other part of that investment is investing in yourself and those around you. So what does it take to go to school at Divine Mercy University in terms of money? Um, it's $1,095 per credit. It's 122 credits, as we mentioned earlier, and that adds up to $133,590. This does not include fees and indirect expenses. Indirect expenses are your housing, travel, things like that, you know, obviously food. Um, and what we, we shy away from <laughs> at the university is trying to put a number on that. Um, mainly because a lot of students have a different level of um, how they want to live. Some students are pretty frugal and they, you know, get several roommates and, you know, they try to limit how much money they're spending on, on rent and, you know, anything associated with living, if you will. Um, they may eat ramen quite a bit, those kind of things. And then there's others that just want a place by themselves and, you know, they have, a, you know, a desire to, to just little, live a little differently, which means it may be a little bit more expensive for them. So your indirect expenses really correlate to how well you manage your living situation. And then, you know, if you're eating out every day, you know, spending 50 bucks a day on, you know, restaurant food, you know, that's one way. And then there's others that, again, shop and they pretty much eat, you know, minimally is what I call it. So, you know, beyond the direct, which is the tuition, you know, think about that indirect because that's something that you want to make sure you're taking care of while you're going to school. Options um, to uh, attend school from both a direct and indirect way. We have federal aid for those who qualify, the William D. Ford and federal direct student loan program, including unsubsidized Stafford loans and graduate plus loans. The financial aid department will work with each student on an individual basis, but to make it really easy on that part, at a graduate level, you have loans that's really backed by the government. And then you have loans that really are based on yours and or your parents' credit history and, you know, some students borrow, um, you know, beyond tuition and use that to live on. Um, some don't. Um, while you're attending school at DMU, we also have scholarships, internal and external. We have assistantships and federal work study programs. Matt is one of our student assistants, and he can tell you a little bit more about his experience but you can earn up to $25,000 if you use all of your student assistantship hours and you're chosen for a student assistantship. So that's another way to lower your cost of education, if you will. And it's only 10 hours um, a week. So it's a, it's a nice way to, again, lower the cost of your education. Um, then there's alternative financing. Some of you are, are have cash plans already available. Some have private funds. Um, there's agencies and organizations that provide matching funds, possible grant programs, support groups, diocesan investments, and approved for veterans funding. So if you're military, prior military, you have access to your family members, um, GI Bill, that's another way for you to help pay for your education. Um, we have a lot of what we call diocesan supported um, religious and lay folks attending Divine Mercy University. Off the top of my head, I think we have close to um, 20 at this time. 
they're being directly supported by a diocese and or parish. Um, and then there's another program called Memorandum of Understanding. Some of you may already be part of a parish or a diocese or a religious organization um, that is participating in an MOU. That's what a Memorandum of Understanding is. And that can offer up to 20% off on your tuition right off the bat. And if you aren't part of one, it's always good for you to inquire uh, through your admissions advisor and or me. I run the program and I reach out to parishes, dioceses all the time. And, and, you know, we do all kinds of different things to, to work with them so that over, you know, once the agreement is signed, um, religious and lay can go to school here and get between 20 and 25 percent off. So for those of you that are dead set, this is where you want to go. You want to move forward. Keep MOU in your head because that's another way for you to get really quick, uh, a really quick tuition reduction. Um, some of the things I've already mentioned early, but in our scholarship side, we have early admission scholarships um, that goes up to three thousand dollars, and we are we are actually going to ex extend that here shortly. Um, so even this group will be able to participate. The Newman Scholarship, which is up to 5,000. Faith and Hope Scholarship, which is 2,000 to 50% off. And normally that's for priests or religious. There's a Patriot Scholarship. Of course, that's relevant to, you know, military. Public Servant Scholarship, you know, EMTs, medical, um, teachers, folks like that. Um, International Student Scholarship. Is there... If you can put it in a chat, you don't, uh, you know, I can't see it, but put it in the chat. If we have any international students, I'd like to know because there's a section coming up that talks about that. And if there's not, we'll go ahead and go past that. But there are international student scholarships. The diversity scholarship, uh, matching scholarship. The matching scholarship is up to $2,000. And the easiest way to, to talk about that is if you work, um, let's say, at a local parish, or ministry or something like that, or you work at, you know, Bob's House of Pizza, and they love you and they want to help you out and they want to donate $2,000 towards your scholarship, they would send that directly to us and then we would turn around and match it up to $2,000. So it's it's a nice way for you guys to kind of self do some self-funding, if you will. There's a grant and aid scholarship up to $3,500. Typically, that is not only for incoming students, but that's a scholarship we look at, you know, five years is a long time and students have things happen in life that, that maybe they weren't prepared for or, you know, require money they just don't have. So they can apply for a grant and aid and scholarship. It's our way of making sure that we help students as, as best we can when they have a big need. Um, and then there's the PsyD scholarship, which is up to 50 percent off. And. Um, you know, I think this group's kind of missed that, but we're in the middle of talking about creating a second 50% scholarship and two more 25%. So right now there's a 50% and two 25% and then there's all these other scholarship offers, but um, we're in the middle of talking with the Dean and the president about uh, adding that for this last group. I, anybody that applies now would be interviewing in our March timeframe and um, that's the last group interview. So we're, we're trying to make sure that they have the same options as the first two groups. The Society Transfer Scholarship, which is $2,500. Then we have a couple of St. Martin de Poor Scholarship, which is $1,000, and the Christendom Scholarship. If you graduated from Christendom, Christendom College, it's $2,000. But we have several MOUs. Um, if anybody goes to, you know, Belmont Abbey, Ave Maria, I mean, we have a pretty long list of schools that we, we provide uh, tuition reduction with as well. Um, so you're going to ask about those schools and we can tell you who's, who's participating and who's not. But these are all scholarships you can compete for. And uh, you definitely want to put them in. For the most part, almost all of our students get scholarships. Entrance requirements. The baccalaureate degree from a regionally accredited or internationally recognized school the undergraduate degree in psychology is preferred, it's not required. And for those that are admitted without an undergraduate degree in psychology, we will be required 
to complete prerequisite courses during the first year of their program. And really is just to help you get familiar with the terminology and, and some basic understanding of psychology. You have to have a minimum GPA of 3.0 on a 4.0 scale. Applicants with a cumulative GPA of less than 3.0 may be considered for admission on a case-by-case -case basis. And really the way we look at it is um, if your cumulative GPA, GPA is 3.0, but your program GPA, let's say, is, I'm, I'm sorry, your, your cumulative GPA is less than 3.0, we look at your core course per or your core program GPA to see if that's higher. And then we actually look at, you know, stuff relevant to psychology or counseling courses you may have taken. And we look at GREs and several other things. So you're not eliminated. Um, we just have to take a look at you a little differently. The application process. One, you complete the online application. Two, our financial aid office will begin working with you upon receipt of the application. Number three, consistent communication is maintained. Um, one of the things that, that I tell everybody in this ID program, you know, especially this time of year, because you're like, you know, hey, graduation's coming up soon if you're still in school. Um, you got a lot of things ahead of you. But trust me, that time between May and August when you start classes, it goes quick. Matt can probably tell you his experience, but one of the things I hear from students all the time is I, I was shocked how quick everything went right after the holidays until I showed up here. It just seemed like it was a minute. So, you know, you got to be in communication with your admissions folks, financial aid, the program folks, anybody that you're going to deal with, it, all that needs to be, you know, constant. And you need to make sure that if you have any questions, any concerns, any anything you need to talk about, please reach out to us. We will definitely help you out and we'll get you to the right people. Number four, once all documents are submitted, you go competitive applicants are interview, invited to an interview on site. Not everybody actually gets invited to an interview. Um, really it's based on, we take a look at the whole package and then the um, program, the SID program folks, take a look at you on paper and they say, here's the ones that we'd like to have interview. Um, most folks know that they gotta meet the entrance requirements. So if you've met the entrance requirements, unless something comes back from your recommendation, like somebody says, don't let this person go to your school, they're crazy, which you probably chose wrong then, is uh, that's where you get knocked out of the box, if you will. Otherwise, you know, your admissions folks will work with you and they'll, they'll make sure you're, you're going down the right path. All right, all applicants will hear back with an admission decision um, by, um, in this case, um, March. It, we, um, the next group interview is March 4th. And if you got a pen, make sure you write that down. March 4th is a group interview. March 9th is the decision date. And then this year, we're doing something a little different. Um, March 11th, we, were, we are going to have a on-site visit day for all the students have been admitted. And we, um, our first group interview was back in um, um, November. Um, and then our next one is actually um, the 21st. And then the last one is in March, as I mentioned. So um, the first two groups, um, one will be doing it virtually, which is the one on the 21st. We decided to, to do that as a uh, virtual so people didn't have to travel with all the travel issues that are out there right now. But the um, November, December group did um, come in and they, they got to do their visit day on campus. So we felt it was, uh, you know, appropriate to allow everybody to have a visit day. And right now, the idea is that anybody interviewing in the March session it will be live unless, you know, something happens with, you know, more COVID things and stuff like that. But it seems like it's going in the right direction right now. And then once folks have been, uh, you know, told or admitted, um, they work with admissions um, and uh, other department chair, other department personnel to make sure they get through the online orientation. They get set up for, you know, their living arrangements 
basically they're preparing to come here and start courses and then classes begin in August of 2022. How to complete your application package. It's important that you know this right here because um, sometimes people get caught up and they, they drag this out when they don't have to. There's two parts. The first one is the um, part one, which is inclusive of your application fee. And that's really just the actual application online that you'll do. And then you'll have your other paperwork like essays, your resume, transcripts, GRE scores, all of those things are what we call part two. So we tell anybody that's seriously interested to go ahead and get part one in because what that does is it also tells financial aid and student success that you're now an applicant and you're starting the process and they reach out to you to take care of the areas they need to do in order to support you during your admissions process. As I mentioned, there are essays is you have three recommendations at least, and then I'm sorry, you have essays and then you have recommendations. The three recommendations, at least two of which must be academic in nature. Um, official transcripts from all post-secondary institutions, and then your official GRE, is, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, please make sure you put the DMU school code of 5639 within, and if you've taken one within the past five years, that can be used. You just need to go back and have them send us the scores. So application deadlines, we, we just finished up with the December 31st group. Um, it says interview January 14th, but because of, of some of the COVID issues, we moved it to the 21st and made it uh, a virtual um, group interview. The next one uh, application deadline is February 18th. And the interview date again is March 4th. The decision date is March 9th. And then again, we'll have a, uh, an open house on March 11th. If, um, if everything's okay, travel's fine, all that kind of stuff, I imagine we'll do the regular standard in-person group interview on March 4th. So I would tell you all that, that are really interested in doing this to make sure you think about that, uh, both in terms of cost to get here and um, the time to do it. Okay. Um, first, I'll say thank you. Sorry. And second, I'm going to go ahead and ask Matt to come back on and maybe talk a little bit about um, his experience, tell you a little bit about what he does outside. I'm sure he uh, already asked, answered some questions, but Matt, maybe you can jump back on. Sure, Tom, right here. All right, got any questions out there for Matt? Uh, we have some really good questions in the chat. Um, and maybe you can help me out with this, Tom. We had a question from Elizabeth right here. Are there housing for families or would I have to stay off campus? Um, I'm, I'm a single guy right now, uh, and uh, I decided to uh, house with a couple of uh, other PsyD students here, and we're, we're all renting out a house out here, um, maybe 10, 15 minutes away from school. So that's the option I chose, um, but I, as far as I know, there's no, there's no housing on campus specifically. There's none. Yes. So then you would have to find it within the area um places to places maybe rent out for 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 the bit and um if you have questions please put in the chat and i can answer them to the best of my ability um, as we're waiting for questions i can tell a little bit uh, and talk a little bit about like um what tom was mentioning before about all the things to do out here in virginia um and he's right um within an hour's drive um you can end up in the mountains um you can end up at a river you can end up um in downtown DC, um, where there's a ton of nightlife. Uh, it's a big city out there, great places to shop. Um, we have a huge mall out here and there's plenty of places to eat out here. Um, there's, there's a ton of things to do, especially with um, with your classmates that and your cohort that you're gonna get really close to. I'm very close with everyone in my cohort. And we try to make it a, uh, we try to make it a thing every week to go out with the priests and all of our uh, all of our classmates to dinner, and we we try a new place every single week, and uh, we're we're not running out of places yet. Um, I uh, sometimes go down to the Smithsonian's in D.C., which are free, um, and just look at there's there's so many things to to do down there. 
Elizabeth here is asking, by integrating Catholicism into our practice, is the population we work with limited? Whenever I try to introduce even a holistic approach with my clients, there's some pushback. So that's a really good question. And we talk a lot about that um, almost every single class that we have. Um, every single class that we take, there is an integration piece of integrating the Catholic Christian model of the human person um, within our practice and what that looks like practically and clinically. Um, now, the idea of integration and um, how we integrate Catholicism within our practice uh, is mainly focused on how we view the person in case and then like conceptualize the person. So for example, um, say I um, receive a client that has depression or suffering from anxiety um, because depression and anxiety kind of go hand in hand sometimes. Um, we're taught in every single one of our classes how to view that person through the lens of essentially God and um, try to see that person uh, through the lens of faith and how to cater to that person uh, via the tools that were given by psychology. Now, a lot of internship and externship uh, interviews will revolve around that question because uh, they, they know that Divine Mercy is well known for integrating spirituality and their Catholic faith within um, viewing the person. And so they'll ask us, oh, you're from Divine Mercy. Um, how do you integrate your faith within your practice? And we're taught how to answer that. And so um, hopefully that provides a little uh, peace in, in knowing that um, that this is on the table. And we are, because we're an APA accredited institution, um, which is very necessary, especially in today's world um, with psychology, the APA is actually looking at um, right now and recently um, adding spirit, a, a spiritual component within their expectations for all psychologists. And so we're actually on the forefront of that in, in pushing for a, a, a closer look at spirituality. I'll answer the uh, transfer credit. Sure. There are some credits that, be, that can be transferred. That's something that actually would require you to submit your transcripts and then a request for um, evaluation for transfer credits. Um, and uh, that's done through the registrar and the program. Great. And then, um, Matt, maybe you can talk a little bit about your student professor ratio and maybe even about, you know, your advisor and how all that stuff kind of works. Sure. Yeah. So our, our student to professor ratio is actually pretty low. I would say it's about um, seven to maybe nine students per professor that we have here. Um, now, that's granted, again, uh, a lot of us are on externship and a lot of us are on internship as well. However, we have plenty of opportunities to interact with our professors. And I'm, I'm, I would say personally that I, um, I'm close with most of our professors as they are so available to just, you know, walk into their office and just have a chat with them. Um, each cohort uh, will vary in size. My cohort has about 11 students in there. Um, the next cohort um, above us has about 12, 13 students. So it's actually really low and, oh, actually, I might change that actually. Some of the nine students is actually pretty high, maybe like four, four to five students per professor actually. So um, there's, there's, plenty of, there's plenty of opportunities to have those one-on-one -on -one talks with professors and definitely get some mentorship from them as well. Appreciate that, Matt. Anybody else got some questions? Thank you, Elizabeth, for your, your questions. And if you have any more questions, um, let me know. All right. Well, sure. I know I want to focus on trauma work. So would I choose a faculty member based on that? Right. Um, so some of our faculty have worked with um, trauma work, um, but all of our all of the faculty um, that we have uh, at Divine Mercy um, all teach us uh, at least two classes, maybe even three or four sometimes. Um, if you want to focus on trauma work, um, there's, you, there's definitely professors. I, I, I'm not personally working on trauma work. There's definitely professors that you can talk to about that that specialize within that field. Um, and I know, like, for example, Willem Johnson, um, who you saw in the video, um, is, is getting, um, he, I've spoken to him before, and he, and he definitely has the support that he needs to do his work as he's on externship right now and working. I, I believe he's working at the VA. I'm right now working um, to apply for externships right now. 
And I'm actually applying to a couple of VA sites as well. Um, and so we'll be working very closely with those with PTSD and whatnot. So. And um, I, I'll add two things to that if, if it's okay. Um, sure. The um, nice thing about um, Divine Mercy University is um, we actually uh, house the Green Cross uh, trauma program, mm -hmm. training program, and we provide training on campus. It's actually run, run through one of the um, doctors in um, psychology and counseling uh, uh, gentleman uh, named Ben Keys, and mm -hmm. it's for all folks who specialize or want to specialize in trauma. And um, they have, you know, Dr. Keys has taken several students from DMU as well as several students from the Green Cross program. A lot of the folks that attend that aren't necessarily our students, they come from all over. Uh, for the training, but um, they've been to um, Charlottesville when that happened a while back. Um, they went down and worked there. They've been in the border of Mexico working with single moms with kids and, you know, all the, you know, trauma that goes on with that kind of stuff, being stuck in a camp with your child and, you know, very little going on outside of that. They've been to Lebanon. They've been to several different places. They're going somewhere this year, and I, I don't, I can't remember where it's at, I apologize. I believe they go to Tanzania. Tanzania. So yeah. mm -hmm. they look for for areas where they can go in and do really good work, mm -hmm. get get exceptional on the job training, if you will, after the classroom experience. And um, it exposes our students, especially to a lot of things that they may not ever see again. But you know, if you're interested in trauma uh, training, you definitely came to the right place. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad that you mentioned that, Tom, um, yeah. because the Green Cross program that we actually run is actually really popular and there's actually a lot of participants that attend. And, and I've heard a lot of great things about Dr. Keyes. I haven't personally met him myself, but I hear a lot of good um, work that's coming out of the trauma work that they do down there. Um, I've been prompted to, to let you guys know that um, because of uh, my the externship that I'm working at right now within your... So if you, if you are... Um, participating within or if you're enrolled in the society program in your second year the externship that everyone participates in right now is um, at the ips clinic which is the clinic that where we see clients and that's run directly out of divine mercy and so all i have to do is go downstairs and go into the clinic and then um, i see my clients in that area so it's connected right with us and so it actually makes um, seeing clients and taking classes really easy because go to class and then after class or on one of my days off, I go into the clinic so I can see clients as well. And that, and that is under supervision. So you're not yes. going in there and just kind of winging it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I, I mentioned before that, um, and I'll, I'll say it again, just in case for, for the new people that came in that um, I am heavily supervised by a supervisor um, and for almost, for every session that we have with our clients, for every hour that I see my clients, I also have an hour of supervision in which we kind of break down how the session went. And also we talk about um, how we want a treatment plan and how we want to approach um, every single thing that comes up within um, the sessions. And so I, I actually feel very supported and very confident uh, right now, especially within my clinical skills especially as it pertains to seeing clients, um, real life clients face to face. Very nice. All right. Elizabeth is asking, what if we are accepted to the start in August, but we would like to place a year hold? Is that possible? Um, I'm not sure why the question, but what I would tell you is, uh, and I say this to everybody, um, if you are trying to figure out how to fund your education or what impediments may be out there that keep you from going, talk to your admissions advisor. My assumption is all of you have been talking to Steve uh, Showalter and um, Steve can help you work through all those kind of things. Um, if it's for other reasons, what I would say is this, um, if you know you can't start in August, then don't apply for August. Um, wait, put your application in at the very beginning of next year um, for the 2023 class. 
um, because when you defer your start date, um, you know, it's not frowned upon per se, especially for good reasons. But if something happens and you already know you are going to defer and then something happens next year where you can't even start in 2023, you know, God forbid, but now you're asking to defer a second time and then it becomes kind of a little bit of a problem. Um, it's viewed as maybe you're not as committed to your coursework as you need to be. So you kind of get dropped to the bottom of the run. And I don't mean that to sound harsh, but, you know, if you're asking that question now, I would tell you to think long and hard about when you need to apply based on your situation. But again, have a conversation with Steve Showalter or myself, and we'll, we'll see what we can do to help you out and maybe give you some guidance on how you can start in the fall, if that's even an option. Can we use three employer recommendations? Um, I'd say try and go back and find an academic recommendation. It doesn't even have to be from a grad school if that's where you, you last attended. If you stayed in touch with a, a grad professor and an undergrad, try to get one or two from them. And then of course you can use employer recommendations as well. And yeah, that's something that you'll work through with the admissions uh, advisor and go from there. All right, any other questions? Matthew, I appreciate your time and, and your, your um, knowledge that you shared with the folks on the, on the webinar here. And uh, I thank all of you that attended. And um, uh, please reach out to Steve, myself, if we haven't reached out to you uh, in the next day or so. And uh, if you haven't started your application uh, and you think you really want to do this, get your application, go on part one especially. Um, we're coming down to the end of the wire of, of getting all that done. And it may seem like, you know, a month away is not that long, but you definitely want to get part one in so you can get the other stuff going as well and you get through the financial aid process. Thank you all. I appreciate your time. This will be recorded and sent out so you can catch up on stuff if you missed it or you wanted to go back and kind of review something. And again, you have all of us as resources to reach out to. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a great night.